reality. But when it comes to the discoveries and the questions regarding matter, we can pretty much trace back most of those discussions to two ancient philosophers. One by the name of Democritus in the fifth century BCE. And what he was most commonly attributed is the concept that at some level, all stuff can be broken down only to a certain point. There must be some sort of indivisible it inside of everything that we can no longer break down and break apart. Democritus called that it atomos, which we would later adopt and adapt as atoms. Not too long after the time of Democritus, however, a couple of other philosophers come along. You may have heard of them. They went by Plato and Aristotle. And Plato and Aristotle had a completely different viewpoint on the world as far as physical material is concerned. Plato and Aristotle said, you know what? There's no end to the ability of anything to continue to break down into something smaller. I can take this piece of paper and I can continue to rip it and rip it and rip it and rip it and rip it. And it doesn't matter how many times I rip it, there will always be something that I can tear apart, tear away from that substance and have something other, something new to look at. And so Plato and Aristotle being what they were, pretty well-known, well-regarded, well-renowned philosophers at the time. And even going back to after the ancient civilizations, getting into the Dark Ages and the Renaissance, these theories of Plato and Aristotle dominated the scientific discourse for not just centuries, but pretty much almost millennia. After the ancient times, scientific thought and scientific discourse kind of went into, I don't want to say a gutter, but it became something far less prominent than the idea of conquest and of setting things up. So from the standpoint of time, notice that we have jumped from 300 BC to 1600 AD with really no net movement in regards to atomic theory. Yes, there were scientists, there were other people in those times, but science kind of took a weird turn in the Middle Ages. Not a whole lot was known, not a whole lot of technological advancements in anything other than crude machinery for building armies, sustaining armies, waging war. But in terms of things like philosophy, wasn't a whole lot done. We hit the 1600s. We moved through the Dark Ages. We moved through uh, at least the first phase of the Renaissance, the first phase of the Reformation, we start to get into the, the Industrial Revolutionary kind of era, or at least the re-enlightenment. We get people like Isaac Newton out there, we get people like um, some of your other great um, physicists starting to kind of bubble to the surface in different parts of Europe. And innovation starts to come along. Technique starts to improve. Technology starts to be used not just for warfare and for city building, but in advancement of knowledge. And so in those times, we see some innovations taking place. Technique starts to improve. We start to find, you know what? 
we've got a pretty convincing evidence that atoms exist. We can pretty discreetly rationalize that there is something fundamental that cannot be broken down any further. We don't know what they're made out of, but we do know, think about some of your biologists and some of your others at the time. We know that there's something to this ID. And by the 1800s, we get a man by the name of John Dalton. And John Dalton develops a series of scientific laws based on observations and uses these laws to develop a full atomic theory. And this is really our first formalized atomic theory. Yes, we can say that Democritus had some ideas, had a philosophy that seemed to include the idea of atoms being possible. But he really didn't have any kind of theoretical grounding to it. John Dalton now does. And he uses these observations, he uses these scientific laws to weave in some of those concepts. And so here is Dalton's atomic theory. It consists of four postulates, four statements of fact based upon other knowledge, other observations of the time. And if we look at the four postulates individually, what we see is a lot of familiar ground. So for example, statement number one, each element is composed of extremely small particles called atoms. I think everybody in this room could pretty easily get behind that statement. It's kind of a statement of faith, statement of belief, not a whole lot of theoretical grounding to it other than observational. And as the microscope was developed, we started to get some more of that theoretical understanding. But it is largely a statement of belief, faith. Second, all atoms of a given element are identical. Stands to reason. Different elements have the atoms that look different from each other. Also stands to reason. Nothing too strange or different or unique there. Seems kind of like a, why didn't anyone say that before statement? Third postulate. Atoms of one element cannot be changed into atoms of another element by chemical reaction. Atoms are neither created nor destroyed in chemical reactions. Now I'm going to highlight two different parts of this statement because they're both important. This first part, again, in our 21st century mindset, that statement seems to be again kind of a, of course, completely makes sense. What was going on in Dalton's time, and especially in the years prior to Dalton, that would make that statement necessary to say out loud and put into writing? Alchemy. Jacob, right? Yes, absolutely. This is a direct salvo against alchemy. Gotta keep in mind, we're not that far removed from the Middle Ages. Alchemy is pretty much the only chemistry of the time. And Dalton's atomic theory puts the final nail in hopefully the final coffin of alchemy. Says, this cannot happen, quit trying. 
going to highlight a second statement here. Put this one in pink. Atoms are neither created nor destroyed in chemical reactions. Now, where have we heard that before? Ben? Yeah. I'm just going to call it the law of conservation. Um, different applications of law of conservation apply differently. Uh, law of conservation of mass talks specifically about mass. Law of conservation of matter talks specifically about things like atoms and molecules. Law of conservation of energy talks about the movement of energy from one place to another. They all kind of start with the same sentence. Blank cannot be created or destroyed in a chemical or physical process. All right, fourth postulate. Compounds are formed when atoms of different elements combine. A given compound always has the same relative number and kind of atoms. I'm going to do a little bit more highlighting here. See if we can remember from our fundamental laws post lecture. So my statement here in orange, compounds are formed when atoms of different elements combine. This is based upon one of those fundamental laws. Can anyone think of what that fundamental law is? Thomas? Well, it's not the law of definite proportions. I would actually say that the blue statement fits that one a little bit more. Because the law of definite proportions talks about if I look at a given compound, it's always going to have the same whole number ratio of one element to another. That's, that's this blue statement. The orange thing is a little bit more generic, a little bit more general. It's the other proportions. The law of multiple proportions. Law of multiple proportions, remember, says that when two elements combine, they can form compounds. And the compounds that they form will always come out in this same whole number ratio of one element to another. So that, what that means is, let's say that I have carbon and oxygen reacting. Well, based upon the amount of oxygen that is present, I could have carbon and oxygen react in a one-to-one -one fashion. I'd get CO, carbon monoxide. If I had enough oxygen, I could actually get CO2, carbon dioxide, one carbon and two oxygens. So it is possible that the same two elements can form multiple compounds. That's what the law of multiple proportions says. What it also says is that whatever compounds that they do form, they'll always form those compounds in a set ratio that obeys the law of definite proportions, law of constant composition. So 
So we can see that those three fundamental laws have a major impact on Dalton's atomic theory. They kind of frame it. They set it up. And so starting from this point, we can get into some other ideas. First of all, now that we know that atoms exist, and we kind of know some of the ground rules about atoms, we can get a little bit more into their construction. Now, it takes a little bit of time. You can see here, we're talking about J.J. Thompson now. J.J. Thompson, his primary work, the thing that made him famous, comes along just before the turn of the 20th century. So 1897, we have the cathode ray tube experiment. So again, we're thinking about John Dalton, 1600s, J.J. Thompson, almost 1900s. We've got a two to 300 year gap between our basic fundamental understanding that atoms exist and actually starting to figure out what make up those atoms. Now, the cathode ray tube experiment is a really interesting one. What we have here is something called a cathode ray tube. Now, for those of you here that are over the age of, let's say, 25, which may not be too many of you, you probably remember cathode ray tubes most commonly because before the age of flat screens, cathode ray tubes are what made a TV a TV. If you ever see a TV that has a big box on the outside of it, that big box is where the cathode ray tube was, was and that was what illuminated the screen and allowed the images to come through. And when a TV quote unquote died, it was because the cathode ray tube more or less became non-functional. And replacing a cathode ray tube costs way more than a new TV, so you just end up throwing the whole thing away. And now you pretty much do the same thing when your flat screen or your LED dies. You just have to do a little bit more because those flat screens and LEDs usually contain mercury, and you can't just throw mercury in the trash. But nonetheless, the idea was relatively simple. Ignore the plates here on either side. What you had was a cathode and an anode hooked up to a battery. And the cathode and the anode, when hooked up to that battery, would shoot out this beam. And this beam of light Kind of looks like what we think of as a laser light. It kind of looks green. What was interesting is that regardless of what the cathode and the anode were made out of, we would always see this green beam of light. Even more interesting, this green beam of light had attractions to magnetic fields, so it would bend in a magnetic field. It would bend in an electrical field. And so even though it looks like light, what we actually know is that light doesn't behave that way toward magnetism. Light doesn't behave that way toward electric fields. If I take a flashlight and shine it into a magnetic field, it doesn't bend all over the place. It just goes in a straight line. So, what this led them to conclude is that this beam is not actually light, it's some kind of a particle. And not only is it some kind of a particle, that particle exists in all things, because it doesn't matter what cathode and anode we would use, we'd get the beam regardless, and is electrically charged because 
things that have electrical charge, those are what respond to magnetic fields. Those are what respond to electric fields. Based upon the movement of that charge, see how it's pointing up to the positive terminus? We can determine that these particles have a negative charge. And so Thompson's conclusions were as follows. This beam, these cathode rays, are particulate. There's something that is in every single atom, and that thing that's in every single atom is electrically negative in charge. Now, he couldn't figure out what the mass was. He couldn't figure out the exact charge, but he knew the ratio between the two. And so this is what became known as the charge to mass or mass to charge ratio. Now it was just up for somebody else to help fill in the gap. And if we could fill in the gap, then we would know what it is that we were looking for. And that comes out of a different laboratory, not too far from Thompson's laboratory. Um, again, one of the really interesting things is that from a historical standpoint, there are two primary laboratories in the world at this point. There's one in France that is working very, very heavily with radioactivity. Some people working there are names that you probably, again, have heard of. Henri Becquerel, Pierre Curie, and his wife, Marie. The other lab is at Oxford University. No, I'm taking it back. It's at Cambridge University in England called the Cavendish Laboratory. And Cavendish Laboratory is home and host to some of the most famous physicists in the world. Other names that you've probably heard of somewhere along the line. J.J. Thompson, Ernst Rutherford, Max Born. Um, eventually, uh, others that play a significant role in the, in the evolution of quantum mechanics. So Robert Millikan and J.J. Thompson both are at the Cavendish Laboratory. They're doing different things, but they're both at the Cavendish. And Millikan starts taking on this idea and over the course of about a decade, develops an experiment that is designed to solve the mass to charge ratio. And how he's gonna do it is he's going to design an experiment to determine the charge of an electron. So he sets up an instrument, looks kind of like this. In the top, in the top area here, he's got a chamber that has a very fine mister, an atomizer. Think about uh, the finest spray bottle in the world. This just puts out these little tiny mist droplets. That's what an atomizer does in this case. And the atomizer isn't spitting out fragrance or um, sanitizer or anything like that. It's spitting out oil. Why oil? Because oil is made out of some really big, bulky hydrocarbons that are very, very easily ionized. And so what happens is that mist comes through and it goes through this very tiny hole right in the middle of this electrical plate. And so these little tiny droplets kind of filter their way through this hole. And as they go through this hole, they get blasted with x-rays. And the purpose of the x-rays, high energy light designed to take electrons and get them all over the place. Um, and so what happens is electrons end up attaching themselves to these oil droplets. 
And based upon the charge of those plates, they are going to fall at different rates because they're going to be more attracted to the one plate versus the other. And so there's going to be greater repulsion forces versus uh, gravity forces. And so Thompson's going to collect tons of, or excuse me, uh, Billiken is going to collect tons of data about how much charge is actually on each of these little oil droplets. And what he ultimately determines is that the, map, the charge of the electron always reduced down to this value, 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. The negative on that value, the negative coulombs is just showing that the charge is a negative charge as opposed to a positive one. Now with a charge, you can plug that into Thompson's mass to charge ratio and determine that the mass of an electron is 9.109 times 10 to the negative 28 grains. So now we've got a very complete picture of electrons. We know that they're in everything. We know that they have a very small mass. We know that they have a relatively small negative charge. And so what we start to see out of that is our first true theory of an atom. So Dalton's atomic theory kind of talked about atoms from a global kind of perspective. This is what an atom is. This is what it is not. Thompson's plum pudding model actually takes the idea of this is what an atom might look like. And Thompson's model says the atom is basically in two parts. There are the electrons, and then there's this kind of soup, goo, that they're sticking in that has a positive charge to basically balance out the negative charge. And so when the plum pudding model gets blasted with energy, like we saw in the cathode ray tube, through the electrical current, those electrons are able to jump out. And that's what makes the cathode rays. And so, based upon what information was available at the time, this is a decent model. Remember, models are something that we use to help us to try to explain a certain phenomenon. That's all that a model is. We're going to talk about lots of models in this class. What we have to understand is that a model is a creation that we as scientists make to try to help us understand why behavior is what it is. Nothing more, nothing less. So when we explain these models, we have to understand these are not pictures of reality. These are visualizations to help us to try to explain and rationalize behavior. Some of them are pretty good at doing both. Some, like Thompson's plum pudding model, don't last very long because new information comes out that kind of destroys what they have. And as I mentioned before, one of those things that we run into is radioactivity. So over in France, a lot has been done with radium. Radium has been discovered in several different kinds of rocks, and those rocks uh, are found to emit tons of energy. Not a whole lot is known about them, so scientists step in to try to figure out what they're all about. One of the leaders of that is Henri Becquerel. 
And he finds, along with, uh, again, it's hard to mention Becquerel without mentioning the Puries. The three of them worked very closely in tandem together. Um, Becquerel kind of tends to be the forgotten man just because of the notoriety that the Curies receive, especially Marie Curie, because she was able to survive much longer than either of her two lab mates did. Um, but they all worked very, very closely in tandem together. What is radioactivity? Radioactivity is the spontaneous emission of high energy radiation and particles. So unlike the cathode rays, where we had to hook them up to electricity to view them, with radioactivity, we get the emission of these high energy particles with no outside interference. And the radioactivity comes into two primary forms, beta radiation and alpha radiation. And we'll get into more of that kind of stuff in chapter 21 when we talk about nuclear chem. The thing to kind of recognize as the difference between the two, beta radiation usually involves the uh, use of high energy electrons. So small charged particles that have very high energy and are usually pretty reactive as a result. And alpha particles. Alpha particles have the same mass as a helium nucleus, so they are quite massive compared to beta particles. So they don't do quite as much in the way of high energy kind of stuff, but their bigness, their bulkiness creates a lot of momentum, creates a lot of design that we're going to find is very useful in a later experiment. And so let's kind of tackle this one together as a group. We're going to talk about something called the gold foil experiment. Now, the gold foil experiment was set up in this kind of way. This is where the alpha particle information is handy. Here I have a source of alpha particles that are going to shoot these heavy particles at this little thin, tiny piece of gold foil. The question is, based upon the plum pudding model, where we've got this matrix of positive soup and these little tiny electrons that we know don't have very much mass and we know don't have very much charge, if we send these big heavy nuclei in their general direction, what would we expect to happen? Well, if it's going to split off, what's causing it to split off? Okay. Which object is more massive, the alpha particle or the electron? Okay. So how much deflection are we really talking about? The only thing that we've talked about that's particulate at this point are the electrons. So if I'm throwing these big heavy nuclei at electrons, which one's going to move out of the way? It's going to be the electrons. So according to the, out, the plum pudding model, we would expect that those big heavy nuclei for the most part, just transmit through that gold foil. Because nothing that we know about really says that there's anything solid in there, particulate in there, other than the electrons themselves. But here's what's interesting. What you described, Ben, is actually what happened. 
Under the plum pudding model, again, we've expected all of those particles to mostly just go straight through. And to the plum pudding model's credit, we see that that is what happens for the most part. Most of those particles do go straight through the foil. But unlike what the plum pudding model expected, what we don't see is that beam going straight through. What we do see instead is some splintering. We see a deflection off to the side. We see some direct deflections. And these would indicate that there's something massive equal to the mass or greater than the mass of the alpha particle inside of that gold foil. Because the only way we get an alpha particle, because again, remember, alpha particles are big. They've got two protons and two, elect and two neutrons. So we're talking about, relative to the size of an electron, something on the order of 50,000 times its size. Getting these kinds of deflections would indicate that there's something even bigger in there, something bigger than the electrons, something bigger than the alpha particles. And so because of this, this calls into direct question the whole idea of the plum pudding model. And the only possible explanation that would seem to make sense is that we keep this general idea about the electrons moving in this kind of diffuse space. Notice that that hasn't changed between the two models. What has changed is that instead of having this overall kind of, who knows what we want to call it for this positive charge, where it's all kind of spread out all over the place, we see that it is this dense center right smack dab in the middle. Now, this is going to lead us in a slightly different direction. And we'll talk more about that direction when we come back to this on Friday.